Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm a health economist at Paraxel. I'm presenting to you a bit of work that I did um, as part of my master's um, in public health. It's very nice to be here because I actually, the reason I started using R was uh, coming to this conference about three years ago. So uh, it's great to now be able to present some work back uh, that I did. So uh, the, my project was assessing the cost effectiveness of warmth on prescription schemes uh, for COPD uh, patients. Why, why, why did I choose this? Uh, at the time, uh, I was working in the NHS. I was doing lots of work around COPD, which is a cold sensitive condition. Uh, there is evidence uh, that if you keep people warm, you improve their symptoms, reduce their uh, healthcare resource use. Um, and that, uh, so uh, that's all great. Uh, at the same time, when I was starting out this work, uh, the cost of living crisis was really uh, reaching a, uh, its its peak. And there were big worries about the risk of fuel poverty. Fuel poverty rates in England were going up, and, uh, which working with respiratory doctors, they were really worried what they, they knew that there was going to be this extra burden of uh, uh, morbidity for COPD patients. And they were essentially sitting around waiting for them to turn up in hospital. Uh, so we're looking at, well, is there a proactive things that the health service can do to help these patients? At the same time, uh, the NHS was going around, uh, undergoing a restructure that in theory should help uh, the health service to, to expand beyond its role of healthcare. Um, and yeah, there's lots of interest in the NHS in, in tackling fuel poverty. So what is a warmth on prescription scheme? There's a variety of schemes that exist. They're mainly run by local authorities, so local councils in the UK. Uh, they do involve uh, boiler replacements. So if someone's boiler breaks down, uh, they'll uh, give you a new one uh, free of charge. Uh, or if you have an inefficient boiler, they'll replace it with a more efficient one. Uh, insulation uh, is part of these schemes, so they'll insulate people's homes uh, if required. And sometimes uh, fuel vouchers will be provided, so helping people with energy bills. Uh, for this uh, study, I was looking at a theoretical scheme. Uh, didn't look at fuel vouchers uh, for lots of reasons, lack of data, uh, a nightmare to cost fuel vouchers, uh, that kind of thing. So the scheme I was looking at uh, was replacing a boiler and insulating someone's home, assuming they lived in a, a semi-detached house, the sort of standard uh, accommodation in the UK. Uh, Markov model built fairly standard uh, for COPD uh, and, and fairly easy to implement in R. The key thing uh, here is the intervention and comparator. So if someone didn't receive a warmth on prescription scheme, we assume their home was below 18 degrees uh, over the winter. Uh, 18 degrees is a sort of level that the World Health Organization and others say you should keep someone's home uh, to avoid negative health consequences. If they receive that intervention, uh, their home would be above 18 degrees uh, for the whole year. The first thing uh, that I did in R was uh, estimate the decline in lung function for people living in warm and cold homes. Um, and bearing in mind this was my master's project, I didn't have lots of data that I could and resource that I could pull upon to do this. Um, so uh, the approach I used was from Starkey uh, uh, and her her PhD thesis, um, where she uh, created these regression equations for predicting lung function uh, in COPD, assumed that there was a 14.6 milliliter decline in lung function, uh, one-off decline in people living in cold homes. So this figure comes from uh, admittedly very old and uh, methodologically not great observational study uh, based in London. Yes, and you can see a graph of sort of what that lung function would look like. There were many limitations to this approach. As you can see, those two sort of red dotted line bars are the, the sort of limits for what we would describe as moderate COPD. So um, your lung function is between 50 and 80% um, of what could be expected 
of someone your age depend especially at sort of higher limits these uh, equations don't quite work um you could have someone with moderate COPD whose starting uh lung function is lower than what what is classed as moderate COPD so it's it's not perfect however I think in all it was very easy for me to test uh and show this um uh, if anyone has any advice on how to create discrete transition probabilities for continuous variables, please do let me know. I'll be interested in hearing it. Given that, uh, I then built the uh, model in R. Uh, I'm always amazed uh, how little code it creates to uh, it takes to create a Markov model or any kind of model in R. Uh, this whole model was uh, 100, 120 lines for the deterministic analysis about the same for the PSA. Um, and bearing in mind, this was one of my first models in R that can really, uh, I imagine that can be condensed even further. Um, I don't know if anyone knows Dr. Tristan Snow Snowsill, but a big shout out to him. He has some great videos on YouTube that I use to uh, help create this. Um, and yeah, if anyone wants to see my code, it's available uh, there. The results of my analysis, so the uh, incremental cost utility ratio um, is quite favorable uh, for warmth on prescription schemes. Uh, yeah, I, the analysis um, I've divided by men and women because men and women have different uh, uh, lung function um, histories. So it was important to separate those out. However, it is initially uh, exciting, but you can see there's quite large uh, uncertainty in the model, particularly around the incremental qualities. And this is part, a lot in due to the variation in uh, acute uh, uh, exacerbations, the AOCOPDs there, um, which drive a lot of that quality gains. Yeah, so conclusion, warmth on prescription schemes um, have some promise from a healthcare perspective for people with COPD, but there is a lack of good evidence um, that can really support this and and, and meant, uh, my model wasn't as good as it could have been. Uh, actually, aside, for, aside from the generation of evidence, there's lots of uh, interesting practical issues uh, of these schemes in the UK. So firstly, actually identifying someone has COPD, their home is cold, and then uh, giving them a warmth on prescription scheme will lead to their home being warm is not a given at all. Firstly, uh, homes in the UK aren't actually that cold, uh, given our weather. Uh, and particularly social homes are actually uh, really well insulated uh, in the UK. So uh, actually identifying people with COPD who have cold homes uh, is, is not easy. It's interesting behavioural phenomena because even if, even if you do identify someone's home will be cold over the winter, that could have a bad impact on their health. It's not one given that they'll want the insulation in the first place. So there was one RCT uh, looking at this kind of scheme and around 50% of people offered warmth on prescription uh, didn't, take, didn't take it up um, for whatever reason. They didn't want someone going in their home and... Uh, doing all the building work, perhaps. Also, there's lots of evidence which says if you help to create someone's home uh, be efficient, it doesn't necessarily lead them to increasing the warmth on their home. It may be that uh, they still heat their home to the same amount, but use the savings they generate from that to do other things, um, which uh, they're more than entitled to do, but doesn't uh, necessarily mean that the as a health intervention, uh, these kinds of schemes uh, will work. That said, uh, if this was a cost benefit um, framework, there are lots of benefits um, to these schemes outside of this narrow healthcare perspective. Um, so these are a good idea, perhaps not from the NHS's point of view at the moment. Modeling in R, I think, you know, uh, I still do lots of modeling in Excel. Um, I really enjoy modelling in R for lots of reasons. I find it much easier to spot and fix issues um, as you go because of the modularity of it. Uh, there are tons of uh, resources available to support new users. A plea that I'll, I'll make to you all uh, listening is it'd be great to have those resources. A, a lot of those resources are 
uh, at least seemed to me to be, you know, my first model. Moving it on to the next stage of more complex models, um, actually lots of which we've seen here today, and also how to implement um, those models in uh, in the real world um, would be really useful. Yeah, also, you know, I don't need to say this, the flexibility of coding in uh, R is, is, is huge, not just for economic models, but more generally. If I was doing this project again with lots of resources, well, yeah, first thing I'll do is make sure I have lots of resources and access to to really good data. Um, but I think I would build the model relying on some uh, of the great packages we've heard about um, throughout this conference, um, speed up my coding, uh, make it more, more reliable. Um, so yeah, that was all I had uh, to present. Uh, that was very quick, but hopefully that leaves us some time for some questions. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, perfectly on time. Um, okay. I guess while we wait to see if uh, people want to type any of their questions in the chat there for Jack to answer, I might ask you a bit of a question in terms of your model had quite wide quality ranges. Did you find that in terms of running scenarios and kind of manipulating your model did you find that r was kind of more helpful in terms of maybe this isn't a markup model maybe isn't the most complicated but in terms of kind of figuring out where that was coming from and in terms of being able to kind of explain that then when someone's looking at your results yeah no uh definitely i think one thing that would have made that a lot more easy is building a shiny app or some kind of interface because in this model i still had to you know change value click run compare to the previous run of the model. Um, uh, but it was definitely, even, even just in code, um, it is easy to interact with and, and change. Um, I think one way where it's much better than that for Excel is if you can make a more efficient model. Uh, yeah, so as you say, this is a simple model. If you have a large model that takes a couple of minutes to run every time, uh, it gets hard to sort of play around with those values and see see what's changing it. Whereas if you can have a more efficient model in R, it's much easier to play around with it. Much like we saw uh, in the last presentation with those live live values changing. And you were talking there a bit about it being your first model and kind of intermediate resources. How did you kind of find the the learning curve? And maybe you could expand a bit more on what you sort of think is is missing beyond those basic kind yeah, of yeah i think um, and uh, i i know there's probably lots of good paid courses that i haven't been on which do cover this so uh uh i think the uh i'd i'd had experience in using r for for other things outside of health economics so i was i i knew how to code the yeah, the the resources available for that sort of level of Markov model are, are that are freely available are really great. But then there's things like so okay, if I wanted to use this in the workplace, I would need to uh, pay this to a client. You can't just give them the sort of rough code that that uh, how to use Shiny, um, create user interfaces that are client appropriate. We've seen uh, things like that assert he package that was presented on uh, Friday that can mean you can help people to be confident in your results um things like uh like that which would be great okay we have a question from Jet in the chat how is the choice of R dictated and in retrospect is there anything you would redo better or insist uh on to drive better acceptance of R or was kind of using R a uh, given already yeah uh, so uh I'm, I'm much more familiar with Excel now um, but when I was building this model, I, I um, was much more familiar with using R than, than Excel. So it was just a comfortable uh, choice for me. Um, I think driving better acceptance uh, of R, I think there's lots of people see, oh, code, I don't understand code, let's not use R. And actually showcase, having great things like this conference which showcase the benefits of R, um, uh, really help uh, I think uh, which uh, I think Jeff actually touched on in his talk yesterday having HTA agencies recognize the benefit of R and then driving the industry would would be you know the best way to do it sort of a bit of a, uh, a stick approach maybe um, but yeah I hope that answers your question Jeff